It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. So glad you're joining us for the next half hour or so, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. A little bit of history, and we're also going to talk to a, a former graduate of the University of Louisville. So, uh, We'll get to that here in just a second, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about some stuff that's been going on on campus during the summer. It's actually been a pretty busy place around here. I'm aware of more than 30 different summer camps that the University of Louisville has been putting on. Engineering, music, medicine. Uh, there's a camp for kids with hearing loss put on by UofL audiology students. A digital media camp just for fifth grade girls. A summer law clinic for high schoolers interested in law. Seems like there's a camp for just about anyone at the University of Louisville. So that's been going on uh, over the summer, and we've done some stories out of it. It's been uh, very interesting talking to the kids and what they've learned over the summer from U of L's finest faculty and students. All right, so what do we got on the show today? Well, she's one of the more than 100 Fulbright scholars from U of L in the past several years. Chloe Zoller has been a bit of a world traveler, and she's getting ready to do some more studying and teaching overseas. And she's one of U of L's outstanding young graduates. She'll be here to talk about her experiences in Columbia, South America, and also at the University of Louisville. But first, most of you know Tom Owen from his days in local politics, or perhaps uh, as the guy who just knows a lot about Louisville history. Well, there's a, now a collection of interviews with Tom Owen going back 25 years, that, and you can watch them in UofL photo archives. He's an archivist, and his name is Tom Owen. He also works at the University of Louisville. He's here along with the guy who recorded those interviews, local filmmaker Morgan Atkinson, and he, they're here to talk about the project. Maybe share a few stories and what you can see if you go down the archives down at U of L and check out the Tom Owen interviews. Is that what they are, Tom? The Tom Owen tapes. Fifty, 50 hours worth. Uh, we think about fifty hours worth. At least, worth, at <laughs> least fifty hours. Well, Morgan worth. seems to think they're longer, Tom. I don't know. Maybe maybe the interviews weren't that interesting. Well, <laughs> there are interviews, and then there are also interviews with persons who were on the other side of a political race and who were observers. Of, pol of my political life, which went on for 23 of 27 years um, in local government. And um, so then there's also just some c raw campaign footage uh, when I ran for mayor in 1998 in the old city. And there are interviews um, with, uh, with constituents, uh, citizens at the door. I'm out mm -hmm. campaigning or I'm on a bus at 28th and Broadway or I'm standing at a bus stop. Um, there are uh, highlights of victories and defeats. Um, so all of that. So it's a collection of material interviews that Morgan did with me. So Morgan, th there's 50 hours, <laughs> which may be more. <laughs> for the, um, and you put these together uh, for what reason? Why did you start videotaping Tom Owen way back when? Well, what, 1990, I guess? Yeah. 89 okay. is the first yeah. one. 89. Okay. Why'd yeah. you start videotaping Tom Owen? I'd started my own production company in 1985, and one of the things I wanted to do was make documentaries about people or groups that sort of make a community tick. And uh, Tom has always embodied for me some of the best things about Louisville. And uh, so I've always been a fan and a friend. And when he said he was going to run for the board in 1990, I said, we ought to start a video diary. And that's how it started. I always had the notion of a finished documentary uh, from these interviews. Still to come. Still to come. <laughs> but at, that's, that's calling a lot of tape. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. I feel disappointed because I think Morgan really thought one day I would really amount to something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just a retired archivist. <laughs> that, uh, of well, some there, someday retired archivist. Someday retired archivist. Retired, archivist, retired that's politician. Right. That's yeah, right. That's accurate. right. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, so these tapes, just to just to reiterate to folks, these uh, tapes that you shot, this video that you shot, Morgan, is being donated to the University of Louisville yes. Archives. So uh, the idea behind that was what? Well, they were in my basement, which is not climate controlled, and I'm thinking these things. Uh, in my opinion, which is not at all objective, Tom is one of Louisville's treasures. I'll make him blush a little bit. And I thought, you know, even if I don't do a finished doc out of this, these, these should be someplace. And uh, the U of L archives were very happy to receive them. And uh, scholars in the future may want to refer to them. Uh, I know Tom has done many things that have helped shape the path of the community. And so, uh, 
uh, I hope they will be of help in the future to people. They were done, and, and the interview sections, I, I think the best way of saving, saying it, Mark, is that um, these were not conversations with um, the interviewer. So True. Um, it was a darkened room with a bright light, <laughs> and, uh, and I would be asked questions, and they would be introspective kinds of questions. What about the campaign? Would you, would you grade this campaign today as we were going through the agonies mm -hmm. of first running for office in 88, 89, or running for mayor in 98, or running for re-election as a Metro Council person down through 2016? Uh, grade, the, grade the campaign one to 10. What are the challenges? What are the strengths, the strengths and weaknesses I'm painfully aware of the weaknesses. As a first an alderman for eight years, nine years, and then a metro council person for another 13, what, 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 the, what, right. what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And as a historian and as a practicing politician, what world did you live through? Mm -hmm. What world did you shape through? So it really was kind of a diary, for lack of a better word. Yes. It was Tom's mm -hmm. thoughts on what was yeah. happening at the time, basically. And In among those thoughts would have been a prolonged season of struggling with a fairness law. Yep. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that in your notes to me, Morgan, that, that you thought that was um, one of the highlights of all these uh, tapes that you put together. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what were some of the things that both of you thought through the, since 1989 to now, what were some of the highlights and some of the things that people would be most interested in in knowing where Tom was at the time, from your perspective, and then I'll ask Tom the same question. Sure. I guess the first one was uh, Tom's stance on the fairness ordinance. Uh, he was, if not the first, one of the first people willing to go out there and push this ordinance. It wasn't a popular stance to many people. And you know, again, not real objective, but I thought Tom showed real courage, you know, sort of a profile and courage to get out there. And uh, he would share in our conversations the battering he was taking from some sides. And so it was interesting to see that. And so that was one, one big one. And then you, and the race for mayor against Dave Armstrong, that was what year? 1998. Right? And he yeah. came so close to winning. And just watching that campaign, you talk about a grassroots <laughs> people's campaign. It, it made uh, Eugene McCarthy's group look like a well-oiled machine. A children's crusade. <laughs> it was and, um, and for me, well, riding the bus with him, seeing him in, interact with people was always great. But election night, through sort of a mishap in the way they were collecting votes, suddenly it was showing Tom was ahead. And I remember this. Yeah. I was a political reporter at the time. Yeah. We covered that race, and I remember that. And Tom, I, I had him mic'd, much to his chagrin, and he's saying, I don't know what I'm going to do if I'm going to win. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's the dog catching the bus, right? That's oh, right. damn, I might have to be mayor. <laughs> yeah, and I think there may be a lot of people in that boat, but... Uh, yeah, we also, um, I also, as a, as a Metro Council person, went through the agony of two removal proceedings. Uh, as a Metro Council person, uh, went through our, in that hiatus between 99 and 2003, I was involved actually opposing the merger referendum. Mm -hmm. um, it ended up passing. I ended up re-entering political life in 2003. So that whole moving from a government for the old city of Louisville to a metropolitan countywide government and reflecting on that in its early formative years is another part of the mm -hmm. reflection and the narrative. We're talking with Tom Owen, former Metro Councilman and uh, I guess what were you before that city councilman? What were the, what was it called? Uh, alderman. Was it? alderman. Alderman. Board of Aldermen. Yes, That's from right. 1990 to 1998. Right. Um, third ward alderman. Right, and he's currently uh, an archivist at the University of Louisville. We're also talking with Morgan Atkinson, who shot 50 hours of videotape with Tom Owen over the uh, past 20 odd years, yeah. <laughs> several yeah. years. Um, so this this archival footage that you've got eventually is going to be where. It's in the archives at U of L, but what's the first phase? The, the first phase and a significant phase is to take the multiple formats and to preserve them 
digitally. So they are now in a digital format, and they can be viewed. They're not particularly well organized, and certainly we do not have the kind of descriptive material that would be useful. Um, but they are available very, very soon in the reading room of archives and special collections, lower level of the external library, and so they can be heard and seen. The goal ultimately, if we can find sufficient funding, would be to make them available online where anyone in the world could look and listen. Well, when someone gets into those tapes, goes down and looks at them, and wants to find out about how the Fairness Ordinance came about in the city of Louisville you know, 30 years from now, and they go and look and see what Tom Owen said about the Fairness Ordinance, what are they going to see? What are they going to see about the well, trials and tribulations of how that well, happened? They're, they're going to be... Um, uh, there are going to be descriptions of meetings with the opponents of fairness. Did you say bad words? Uh, I'm a little concerned <laughs> about that, frankly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am a little concerned about that because they were personal interviews with a active politician who had the eye and the sensibilities of a trained historian. Mm -hmm. So I understood that I was saying things that, that might others may be, see that or other hear might see and hear, now, yeah. but at the same time, the very nature of the format was introspective and reflective, and so yes, there may be moments that I will regret that you were you were pissed off. <laughs> oh yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> but it all came to pass, and the fairness ordinance got passed. Ironically, in the nine the nine year season of pushing for fairness through some really rough times, it passed after I left the aldermanic role and was gone for four years. So my, my successor um, for that four-year hiatus, the successor was involved in actually passing fairness, but we had pushed stridently and steadily for nine years. Was it a mistake for you to run for mayor way back when, or are you glad you did it? Oh, I'm awfully glad I did it. Awfully glad I did it. It was um, revealing. It was um, uh, a massive drain of energy. Uh, I took a six-month unpaid leave from the university uh, in order to do, uh, to run. Um, but no, I and, you know, I'm not positive of this, and maybe this is just my need, but I believe the person that ended up winning, Mayor Armstrong, actually used, borrowed, and was enriched by some of the ideas that had been generated by our campaign. Maybe that's just my no, struggling no, I, I at ego. No, I think that's true of a lot of but political But I candidates. certainly yeah. think that I contributed to some significant shaping of the community. Uh, believe me, Dave had his own ideas, and I don't want to right. take a thing, a, a thing away from him. But I do think I saw resonance of our campaign in some of the language and some of the decisions and some of the policies that he adopted. Talking with Tom Owen from the University of Louisville, Morgan Atkinson, who's a local filmmaker. Morgan, what were some of the things that you recall, some of the interviews that you would say, you know, I'd go back and look at that again. If I were Joe Schmo on the street, I'd want to go see that. Uh, or something, you know, recall something that maybe struck you, you know, now years later right. you're looking back saying, well, that was really cool. Uh, well, one of the things that struck me was talking to some of his opponents uh, who he had uh, run races against. And there was, you know, there's always a few bruised feelings, <laughs> but in, gen in general would be their, their awe, you know, like, well, we thought we were in a good position, and then Tom brought out his troops, and suddenly there were yard signs everywhere, and that damn drawing of him is looking like Abe Lincoln, and we didn't stand a chance. <laughs> and one of the fun things was going with Tom door to door as he'd in interact with people. And, you know, who likes to have somebody come to their doorstep? You know, what are you selling? But Tom had a pretty good percentage rate of getting people to interact and interact and talk with him about the race and what they were concerned about. You actually also, um, at least according to the list, I haven't seen it, but you also interviewed uh, the victor in the mayor's race. Um, His a, campaign manager, uh, oh, uh, Jim McGovern. Jim McGovern, oh, Jim yes, yeah, yes. Still around. Yeah. 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 And also interviewed David Hopp yep. uh, at the Courier-Journal to reflect on the race. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, um, there's kind of the candidate, 
uh, the political figure, and then there's the uh, broader context. And that also is among these tapes. And what is there anything, Tom, that you, reflecting back now on your political career since it's over, that you regret that you didn't do or something you did do that you regret? Well, um, sure. Um, I, I Actually, I wish that I had... Um, uh, ended up finding legs and been, in some ways, a more effective legislator. I had significant, significant strengths as a member of the Board of Aldermen and as a candidate and as a, uh, uh, as a member, a long-term member of the Metro Council. Um, but I, there were also some significant shortcomings. I, I did not have um, the will to be a law writer, law maker. Uh, that's door to door down the hallway. Mm -hmm. In the case of 26 members of the Metro Council, a, a, a daily, a sustained hustle. Um, I did well by my district. I thought I was awfully effective with colleagues on both sides of the aisle because I did not have a long memory full of bitterness. Mm -hmm. And so those were strengths. But I think generally speaking, uh, I looked over at colleagues and understood that there's a different breed of cat. And some of them may not always be popular, but they are sustained and effective legislators and read that as a lawmaker. Okay. And as a historian, archivist, and former politician, what are the things, one, two, three, or maybe we just one, two, that <laughs> the city of Louisville needs to do right now uh, to uh, make progress over the next 50 years? Finish the 100-mile loop. Come on. Let's get it done. The parks. Uh, that is the bicycle, yeah, the bicycle pedestrian yeah. loop around the 100 miles and connected with a smaller necklace through southern Indiana using the Big Four and the uh, Norfolk Southern K&I Bridge. Okay, that's um, one. Somehow, somehow deal with the significant gap between the comfortable folks and neighborhoods and the neighborhoods of violence and dysfunction. Um, that is painful, significant, and it's much more complex than just bridging the Ninth Street divide. It is. Uh, in, in addition to that, I think it's very, very critical um, that we find ways of, of, of trying to transcend polarization um, kind of an ideological polarization. Republicans versus Democrats well, right now. And Pre also, yeah, and also just those painful social issues um, involving distance on abortion lines and those kinds of things. Right. Um, I think that can be done. I think to the extent that there are conversations between people who are significantly different from one another, uh, progress can be made. Okay. All right. Once again, uh, these are the tapes of... Uh, interviews and footage from Tom Owen over the years uh, from uh, Morgan Atkinson and they're at the U of L archives. Can folks get access to them right now? Or are they still being digitized? Uh, no, they're digitized okay, and they so, are available. So if I go down the archives right now, I can go look at them. I think the best I can do is provide you with pages of list and okay. we'll do our best okay. to plug it in and see what we and can do. And you can go down and talk to Tom Owen himself at the U of L archives <laughs> if you show up at the photo archives. Yeah. All right. Very good, gentlemen. Appreciate you being on the show, Tom. It's Thank always you. Good to see you. Good to see Tom you. Tom Owen, Morgan Atkinson. Chloe Zoller was a McConnell Scholar at the University of Louisville, one of just 40 students in that program each year, and she graduated in 2016 and won a prestigious Fulbright Scholarship to Columbia, South America. She's here to talk about that experience as well as where you're headed next. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having Good me. Good to see you, Chloe, finally. We, we had a little mix-up. We tried yeah. to have you on a little earlier and had a little medical issue, so here we are. I'm All clear. Right. So Glad you're here. Glad you're here. So you're back in the States for I am. a little while. I got back in end of February, and I'll leave again in mid-September. Okay. So. Well, let's backtrack a little bit. So you were a McConnell Scholar at the University of Louisville. I was. I was from where? Where are you from? I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I went to Assumption, but um, I went, I, and I was only, I think, the second person from Assumption to become a McConnell Scholar, so I'm trying to continue to create that legacy so more students come. But, yeah, it was a great experience. I'm very thankful for it and very formative. So what would you learn? A lot. <laughs> um, I learned a lot about my particular interest, which was interesting because most McConnell Scholars tend to go down the more domestic route of politics, and my interests are almost exclusively international. So I was really grateful to the program. They allowed me to create like an international 
to create my own experience out of what they had to offer. So I learned a lot about myself and my interests in politics, which was cool. Well, part of the McConnell Scholar experience is going to China, Yes. right? So you did that. I went to China. That was an experience. I never would have gone, I don't think, I mean, maybe one day, but if they hadn't pushed us to do that. And so I'm very thankful they did because that was a part of the world I knew nothing about. And I'm very, very grateful to have gone. It was <laughs> challenging. It's, a com it's completely opposite of what we know. So that's always interesting. But I'm glad I went and I would go back. Did you learn anything in China? What'd you learn? You I did. Completely opposite. What'd you learn? Well, I did not learn any Chinese, which is the first question everybody asks. <laughs> Nobody I can say Chinese. hello in America, and that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, I learned. We learned a lot about like Japan and U.S. relations, and some stuff about Taiwan. But mostly, it's just cultural observations. It's just like recognizing the different habits and the different lifestyles that the Chinese people lead, which was really, really cool. And I liked being with my class because you in the McConnell program, you know, you go to seminars and you go to lectures, but it's not always just your exclusive group. And there were eight of us together for five weeks in a completely foreign country. You have to bond, you know, so we really, really enjoyed that time together. And I miss my classmates. I haven't seen them in a long time. Yeah. So you graduated from U of L in 2016 yes. with a degree in a uh, degree in political science and Spanish. OK. And you win a Fulbright scholarship. Yes, Why I did. Tell folks what a Fulbright is. So Fulbright, um, according to the State Department, is the premier international scholarship of the U.S. government. Uh, it is funded by the State Department and by the countries that they partner with. It's all over the world, and it's become a cultural exchange. It was originally just U.S. students going to do research and teach English abroad. But ever since the last um, couple of decades, they've been developing programs where they also send students from other countries into the U.S. to study and to teach. And it's amazing. I was the second U of L student to ever win one to Columbia. The one before me was also a McConnell scholar named Robert Works. And my placement in Columbia was in the middle of nowhere. It was in southwest Columbia, about six hours south of Bogota, the capital. And no Fulbright had ever been there in the 60 years of the program. So it was a very, very authentic, <laughs> interesting experience. Authentic. That's yes. a good word. Yes. Uh, primitive, rural. Uh... It was pretty rural. My city was the biggest city in the region by far at about 300,000. Mind you, about half of that I could never really access because of security reasons. It just wasn't safe for us to go into certain parts of the city. Uh, it was called Neva. It's in the Wheeler region. And it's really not... It's really, you don't ever see foreigners there. I mean, like, if we saw a foreigner, all of our heads would whip around, even ours, you know, because you just don't see it. And um, it was, on average, about 102 degrees Fahrenheit every day Is for the year. <laughs> yeah, that's but all. But it was dry heat, right? It no. It wasn't, wasn't bad? No. It wasn't like it wasn't Phoenix, dry heat. people say it's dry heat, it's not that hot. No, it's not as humid as, like, a Kentucky summer, but it's pretty bad. And... Um, it was just really interesting. I mean, I was placed at a school that uh, had an English requirement. Well, the assumption on Fulbrights in Columbia is that you're teaching at university level, which is not common for Fulbright. Usually you teach high schoolers or middle schoolers or something like that, but we taught university students. And they assumed that our students would be of pretty average speaking level, able to have conversation, then it would be more of a cultural exchange because that's the, mm -hmm. the job. But my students, of the 200 I saw in a week, maybe six of them could have a conversation with me in English, and only maybe three could have a decent conversation. None right. of them could have like what we're having English. right now. Very broken English, which is fair because Colombia as a country is one of the most geographically isolated countries in the world. I mean, it's got all the different ecosystems you can imagine, and you can be in one city and then you can cross a mountain range and it feels like you go back 30 years. So it's understandable that they haven't had the access to English as people in big cities would have or in other countries would have. But that was very challenging because I'm not trained in teaching or, and I haven't taken a grammar class since I was in high school so that was a big wake-up call for me and I was lucky enough that I was at the university with another Fulbright girl and we lived together and I do not know what I would have done if, if she hadn't, hadn't been there right. yeah yeah, yeah. we're talking with Chloe Zaller who is a former Fulbright former Fulbright scholar from the University of Louisville and UofL graduate um, what what did you learn out of Columbia I learned a lot about the country. So a lot of people may not know uh, who don't follow international news, and even those who do, honestly, because Latin America is not covered like it should be, that Colombia last year reached a peace deal. It had the longest civil war of any country in South America. 
Uh, it was about 55 years when they reached this peace deal. So I was there for that, which is the main reason I applied to be in Colombia, because that's my interest in international relations is peace and conflict studies. And uh, I learned a lot about what it means to like what the price of peace is, because people think, why would you not want peace? And why would you know? But it's so complicated. In Colombia, the first time they had the vote for peace, it actually got rejected. Yeah, I remember that. Because, you know, there, there were so many reasons. And I personally that was surprising couldn't. No one could understand. No one outside of the country could really understand why they would do that. And there were a number of factors that played into it, including natural disaster that happened on the coast that prohibited a lot of voting. But mostly the argument was that they didn't feel like it, they were getting justice. You know, they were getting peace by not having arms and the factions of the dangerous parts of the country, but they weren't getting the justice that they wanted for all of the victims. So. Are, are the views of Colombia that Americans hold accurate? You know, <laughs> drug lords running the country and, you know, everybody's smuggling uh, dope into the United no. States. Is any of that accurate at all? No, it really, truly isn't. I mean, Colombia does have pockets of the country that are still dangerous. There are um, areas in Colombia you would not want to go to, but you know that. And when you're there, you have the embassy sending you emails saying, saying be careful of this highway. There, there are some ELN people still there. What, what's or ELN? It's one of the... Um, Guerrilla groups. One of the groups, yeah, one of the guerrilla groups. Uh, so you have that, you, but it's like any other country. And I mean, I traveled overnight on buses alone as a young woman, and I never felt unsafe. Colombians are so kind and helpful. And the cool thing about being in Colombia this last year was that for the first time ever, Colombians feel safe traveling in their own country because for the last 10 years, it has gotten progressively safer. So you're not just a tourist doing all the things that tourists do. You're experiencing the country with Colombians. And the lessons you learned at the University of Louisville that you could take and apply uh, to your studies and uh, to your minglings with the Colombians, what were they? Well, U of L teaches you a lot about the importance of diversity. It's a pretty big campus. It's an urban campus, so it, it teaches you to engage well with students. And the main thing that I took and learned, it took with me from U of L going into Columbia, was actually leadership lessons that I was taught through the Engage Lead Surfboard um, at U of L. They have a couple of really cool personality type tests where you learn about your strengths and your weaknesses. And I really um, developed those my senior year because I led the freshmen in learning about those. And so I took those and I understood who I was and what I could offer. And then I came to the table wanting to listen to Colombians. And like, you know, L really taught me the importance of that about, you know, knowing who you are, but also not assuming other people's problems and situations and being able to give what you have to people based on what they need. Talking to 2016 U of L graduate Chloe Zoller. So you're headed to someplace else now. Where? Yeah. Tell us where. So I'm moving to London in about two months, a little under two months, to get a graduate degree, and I'm very ready, very excited to go back to school. I'm, I'm a major nerd for school, so. <laughs> major nerd for school? Yes. Well, I hope your parents don't hear this and say, "Oh, she's trying to get away from us." Oh, they know. They're used <laughs> to it. I've been doing this since I was young. So. And, and what are you going to do at uh, in London, and and how? What do you hope that will lead to in terms of a career? Okay. Uh, I am going to get a master's at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I've had my eye on that program for quite a while. It's a really, really diverse program. It has a diverse body, of faculty body, but it also has a very diverse student body, and it's very selective. So they choose students who have all these unique experiences so they can really come together and we can challenge each other. Uh, I will be getting a master's in international relations, and I hope that while I'm there I can get some sort of internship and also do volunteer work so I can test out for sure what I want to do because I'm not positive. Part of me really wants to go into foreign policy. I'm really interested in security studies and maybe, you know, eventually working my way up into the State Department or the Defense Department. But the other part of me is really passionate about, you know, like I said, peace and conflict and more of like the on-the-ground part of it. So. I have to figure out which of those two I'm most interested in. You'll figure it out. You're I a smart think so. Kid. Yeah, All I right. hope so. Chloe Zeller, it's always great to see you. Nice and to see you, welcome too. Welcome back. And maybe when you get back from London, we'll check Talk in again. then. Talk again. There That'll you go. That would be nice. All right. That'll about do it for the show for today. Thanks for listening to L Today with Mark Hebert. And go Cards.